He has made time for us to be the commencement speaker at West Coast University in 2014. Thank you for welcoming Dr. Jennifer Arnold. Thank you very much. That was such a lovely introduction. I can't thank you enough. I, I, um, it's an honor and a privilege, privilege to be here. Um, you guys do seem like a very happy crowd. Um, I guess this is a pretty big day, right? Yeah. You, you honestly should be very proud of yourselves because graduations don't come every day. And I remember the day that I graduated from undergraduate and then the day that I graduated from medical school. And each of those days um, were pretty momentous memories in my mind. And they really shaped, uh, the, the, basically, uh, my future. And so today is the first day of your future, OK? So give yourself a round of applause really quick. Congrats. All right. They tell me I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to do my best to tell you everything you ever wanted to know. No, just kidding. But in all seriousness, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here, and I want to thank you first to the graduates of West Coast University and the faculty and staff for inviting me here today. Um, you know, today is a day to celebrate achievements, and now more than ever, each of you graduates, isn't that a great thing to say? Each of you has the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others through your profession. Whether it's dental hygiene, nursing, health administration, occupational therapy, all of these fields are touching the lives of patients every day, and your future is bright. And my goal of this address today is to hopefully share with you my hope for your future. And that hope is that now that you have the power to heal, can you maintain the courage to be humble? So, let me get a little bit into that. First of all, I am sure each of you out there knows all too well that what you accomplished today is no small feat. The path to becoming a healthcare provider or an administrator is extraordinarily challenging. I know, I went through it. It's expensive, it's physically exhausting, and it requires personal sacrifices for you, and likely for those around you, all of your supporters who are in the stands today. Despite all of those economic, mental, physical, or emotional challenges you may have faced to get to this day, my hope is that you not only practice the field of healthcare with a sense of pride, joy, but also humility. Let me share a little bit what I mean by humility in healthcare. I'd like to share with you the story of a person that's very near and dear to me, and that's actually my own doctor, my surgeon, Dr. Stephen Kopitz. As you may or may not know, if you've watched our show, I not only have a type of skeletal dysplasia that results in short stature, but I also have a type of skeletal dis dis duh, dysplasia that requires a lot of orthopedic surgeries. So essentially, I've had about 30 growing up uh, to be able to stand straight, um, to you know, do the things that I do every day, to raise two crazy toddlers. And it's because of those 30 surgeries that I am here before you today and that I'm able to lead a functional and very happy life. Dr. Sco Stephen Kopitz was a pretty amazing man. He actually was a pediatric orthopedic surgeon when I met him, just starting his practice, you know, not long out of medical school. And he found the need to specialize in a group of patients that were underserved up until that time, children who had skeletal dysplasias. He saw kids who had never walked before in their teenage years, adults who were crippled because of the bone deformities that they were dealing with. And he said to himself, this is a population that someone needs to learn more about and take care of. And so he did. He dedicated his career to taking care of people with skeletal dysplasias just like myself. Well, let me tell you, Dr. Kopitz was not only a very talented surgeon, but he was the type of surgeon who had compassion and love for every single one of his patients. When I was a kid growing up and when I would go to see him for a checkup, we were essentially given beepers. Why? Because we knew we'd be waiting a really long time to see him. And when you would be in the waiting room, waiting for five, six, eight hours, 
Some of the newbies would complain. Oh, I can't believe I'm waiting so long. This is not worth it. The seasoned patients like myself and my parents knew it was no big deal because what we knew is that when you got into that room with Dr. Kopitz, he was gonna give you as much time as needed, not only to care for your medical issues, your orthopedic issues, but to care for you and your family as a whole. He truly believed that taking care of patients was more of a compassionary field, not just a medical field. So Dr. Kopitz, as I mentioned, would spend three hours with a patient if he needed to on their first visit. He would operate for 12 hours on a patient if so required. He would operate most days from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. and often did his rounds after surgery in the middle of the night. And that was the kind of doctor he was. He practiced medicine because he truly and deeply loved his patients. To give you an example of his dedication, when I was about two, I was just diagnosed and I was seeing Dr. Kopitz for my first surgery and that was something called a cervical fusion. I had to have a cervical fusion because the top of my vertebrae were too unstable. And if I had fallen, you know, just being a silly toddler, you know, from a short height, I could have been paralyzed from the neck down. Well, Dr. Kopitz knew exactly what to do and fused my, my neck and sent me home in a halo to recover. A halo is essentially a contraption with screws in the skull that go around and hold your neck still while you're recovering. Many of you may have come across a patient in your training thus far in a halo. Well, when I was home, I was a very active, feisty two-year-old and didn't want to take some medicine for a cold I had. And I kicked my leg so hard at home, I knocked the front two screws out from my halo. Well, I was actually home in Orlando, Florida, and my doctor had been in Baltimore, Maryland. I had had my surgery in Baltimore, and we had flown home for recovery. My parents, of course, frantic, called 911. We rushed into the, you know, the emergency room at our local hospital, and the doctors there said, hmm, I don't know if I've ever seen one of those. I'm not sure what we can do, but we can try to put it back together. Oh, you can imagine the anxiety on my mother's face at that response. So they immediately called Baltimore and tried to reach Dr. Kopitz, but unfortunately, he was not in town. And in fact, he was in South America about to receive an award for the work he did. So the office said, we're so sorry he's not in. We don't have any way of reaching him. He checks in periodically. We'll let him know as, you know, as soon as he calls what's going on. And so my parents waited. And probably about five hours after all of this, Dr. Kopitz apparently felt the need to call the office. And when he did, they told him what happened. In true Dr. Kopitz manner, he took the first flight from South America to Miami, drove to Orlando, and put my halo back together. <laughs> I share with you that story because that was a pretty extraordinary effort by a pretty extraordinary person who made a huge difference in, in my life, in the life of my family. And I have to tell you that he's, I was not the only patient for whom he did such, such things for. In fact, he even missed his own award ceremony in order to do that. So as you can imagine, when I first decided to go to medical school, Dr. Kopitz was my role model. He was my hero. And I'm sure that each of you have been greatly inspired by another teacher, a colleague, or a mentor during your schooling. And as I look at each of you today, adorned in your academic regalia with your tassels on, I remember my graduation day from medical school. It was quite a day. Um, just like you, I had overcome many hurdles to get there. And I was very fortunate that Dr. Kopitz had attended my graduation ceremony. After that ceremony, we went to dinner. And it was a wonderful dinner. I was just so happy to be done with four of the toughest years of school that I ever imagined I could go through. And I was looking forward to becoming a resident and taking care of patients, as I'm sure many of you are. At that dinner, however, Dr. Kopitz took me aside for a minute and he said a few words. He said in his very thick Hungarian accent, because he was from Hungary, my darling Jennifer, remember, God is the healer, we are only his hands. Do not forget, <laughs> you can clap. <laughs> 
I get teary-eyed when I say this. Do not forget that you are first and foremost a person with humility and compassion, and now the privilege to heal. He said, remember that what you bring to the table of medicine is more than what medicine will bring to you. And whatever you do, do not let the rigors, the fatigue, or the competitive culture of healthcare take away your humanity, your humility, or your dedication to your patients. In very few, in just five minutes, Dr. Kopitz had shared with me what he had learned over a lifetime of healing. And that is that practicing medicine is more than just using your knowledge and your skills. It's about passion and compassion. And essentially, he was teaching me the power of being humble. So now, each of you, you're becoming caretakers, healthcare providers, nurses, therapists, dental hygienists. You're going to encounter patients every day. And in your practice, you'll have to ask yourself, first and foremost, am I a good healer? And second, can I maintain humility? To answer these questions, you first have to define what it means to be a good healer. Well, I think many of these attributes were embodied in Dr. Kopitz. Talent, in intellect, technical expertise. He was very evidence-based, but he also had compassion in a good bedside manner. He was collaborative, worked as a team with the nurses and the physical therapists that helped take care of his patients, and he was very humble. I think each of these traits are probably very self-evident to you, except for that of humility. Because, as many of us know, the hidden curriculum of medical education can sometimes promote the opposite. It promotes entitlement. I paid my dues. I worked hard. Now I'm entitled to X, Y, Z. Additionally, we are surrounded in media today with those personifications of doctors and nurses who promote this type of entitlement as well. Think about House MD, who knows it all. Dr. McSteamy, or Dreamy, the sexy take over, take charge surgeon in the OR. We're surrounded by these personifications of healthcare. However, patients not only come to you looking for answers, treatment, expertise, and sometimes miracles, but what they want to know, what they need the most, is humility and compassion. One thing I'd like you to think about as you enter the practice of healthcare is that no matter how well trained, experienced, or intelligent you are, I guarantee that there will be cases that you will encounter that you cannot solve or patients you cannot save. This is pretty depressing on some level, but it's also, I think, relieving because it tells us that it's okay to not know it all and not be able to be perfect. In a wonderful essay by Dr. Jack Coulihan in 2011 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, he describes that virtue of humility and it's important in medicine. He described three parts to humility that I want you to remember. First is a constant self-awareness. Second is empathetic openness. And third is a keen appreciation of and gratitude for the privilege of caring for others. In many ways, humility is the opposite of entitlement. So what does it mean, that first aspect of humility in healthcare, to have constant self-awareness? Well, essentially it means the confidence to know what you do know and be confident in that, but to also accept your limitations. It's a very fine balance. When someone once asked me what does it mean you know, to have constant self-awareness as a resident, I can remember exactly what that meant. I will share with you an example that I did when I was in training, taking care of a baby in the delivery room. It was a mom who was about to deliver and she was undergoing general anesthesia because she had herself had many surgeries. And so she had been under for quite some time before they delivered the baby via C-section. When they did, the baby came out blue, limp, and doing nothing. I was the very exuberant, self-confident, second-year resident responding to this delivery with one of our nurses. And in that situation, I had to provide positive pressure ventilation. I had to bag my patient. And my fellow was not around because he was at another delivery. 
and the respiratory therapist was not around because she was with my fellow. And it was just me and our nurse, and the two of us were responding and resuscitating this baby. So we started drying, stimming, suctioning, taking care of this newborn, bagging, and the baby still did, did nothing. After about two minutes, we had had a good heart rate, but still no respiratory effort. And after three minutes, a nurse with me, she said, uh, Dr. Jen, don't you think we should call for help? I said, no, 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 we got it. We have a good heart rate, the baby's pink, and we're bagging. Oh, that was a mistake. Thankfully, the baby did fine, but we had to bag that baby for almost 10 minutes before the baby retain, regained spontaneous respirations. I share that story because that baby did just fine. However, that was a moment where I should have learned that I did need help and that it was okay to call for that help because should things have not turned around, we would have been in big trouble without the hands we needed. So that's what I mean by constant self-awareness. It's aware of, yes, you're capable. Yes, I could provide the resuscitation needed for that baby, but I had limitations. I should not have been doing it in a silo. I should have agreed with the person next to me and said, yes, let's call for help, so that we had all hands on deck should an emergency go worse. So I hope you'll remember that story as you go out and take care of patients. The second aspect of Coolahan's definition is empathetic openness. Essentially, that means the ability to understand or feel another's pain. As a healthcare provider, you may not always be able to completely understand another's suffering, but if you attack each patient's suffering with an understanding of your own past suffering, you'll be able to show true empathy. My Dr. Kopitz, my role model, had shown me that when I was in college. I shadowed him one summer when I was thinking of going into medicine. And we saw, for the first time in my life, a patient die. A little boy who wanted to walk and couldn't. He was trying so hard to be able to play basketball that he was willing to undergo surgery despite the risk of death because he knew he had a heart condition. The doctors and nurses felt that, well, it was risky, but it was worth it to give this boy a chance at the life he wanted. And I saw him undergo surgery at that moment and then unfortunately not make it out of the operating room. That was probably one of the worst experiences I ever had as I contemplated going into healthcare, to see a little boy who reminded himself of me, who just wanted to walk and get around like anybody else, but to unfortunately lose his life trying to do so. At that moment, Dr. Kopitz um, said, you know, said to me, Jennifer, stay right here. Don't leave the room, because I was shadowing, remember. I was not doing anything. He said, but watch this. He said, this is what healthcare is all about. And I saw Dr. Kopitz not only try to resuscitate that little boy, but then go talk to the family. And when he did so, he cried. He cried so hard, I had never seen, he made me cry, seeing his, as he talked to his, this little boy's parents. And what that showed me is that it's okay to show empathy in our profession of healthcare. It's okay to cry with our families in times of need. It's not a sign of weakness, but rather it's a sign of strength. Last, how do we maintain a keen appreciation and gratitude for the privilege of caring for others? Well, you know, every day, each of you, as you go into the practice of healthcare, may be bombarded with patients to see, you may be writing papers, you may be in, in overwhelmed with administrative tasks. There are so much to do in healthcare today, but remember that each of us wants to be treated as if we, uh, treat us ourselves the way we would want to be treated. Remember that during the time of need is when we need to most remember and take a moment to be a healer and not to be overwhelmed with the craziness that is around us. So I ask you today, graduates, are you humble? To find out, answer these questions to yourself. First, do you take an opportunity to claim credit for things that you're involved in, regardless of the level of your involvement? Do you like to be right and prove to others what you know? Do you think your role as a healthcare provider is more important than that the role of another, such as a janitor, a teacher, or politician? Do you believe you're capable of handling things on your own without the help from others, or do you ever brag about things you can do? Well, if you've answered yes to any of these questions, I would implore you to reflect on your courage to be humble. And it's okay if you have, because I think we all have at one time or another. 
But if we can continue to remember these questions and remember the value of humility as you take care of patients, if, as you run hospitals and administration, as you see patients come in at all ages into your clinics, then you will have been a doctor, a nurse, a, phys a nurse ther a respiratory therapist, a any healthcare provider with true humility. It was only a few years after my graduation day that unfortunately Dr. Stephen Kopitz, my role model, passed away from a brain tumor. When he passed away, he took the hearts of thousands of patients with him, but he left a legacy of the true profession of medicine. Well, healthcare, as you guys will experience it in your work, is so different than the healthcare of Dr. Kopitz. His era was an era where healthcare was still an art more than a business. He was able to be a cowboy doctor and do things that maybe no one else had tried before. But now medicine is so complex that it's all about working as a team. And in that team, if you can work as a true partner with your colleagues, you will have true success. So, despite the fact that medicine is changing, and maybe we all can't be a Dr. Kopitz, I hope that you'll maintain humility. Because now, at this very moment, each of you in your field have the broadest and most comprehensive fundamental basis of healthcare than you'll ever have again. Yes, your brains will start to forget certain things that you've learned today, and that's okay. Because today you're an embryonic, pluripotent stem cell. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> and just like a developing embryo, your stem cells will later on, as you go through your career, differentiate into very specialized cells. It could be hepatocytes, could be neurons, could be lymphocytes, whatever it is. Remember, as you become specialized in your career, whether it's a specialty in nursing, in dentistry, in administration, remember this day. Remember, as you mature in your role of a healer, to not forget about your beginning and why you entered this field. I suspect that the day you entered the halls of West Coast University, you were filled with humbleness. Now you have and will continue to develop that power to heal, but don't forget about the ability to be humble. If you know your biology well, and you know the role of stem cells, that they actually exist even when we're mature adults, right? We all have stem cells in us, and their job in your body is to replenish adult tissues. So remember your stem cells when times are tough, when academia, patient care, administration is pushing you too hard. Remember why you entered this field. Think of Dr. Kopitz and allow those stem cells to replenish you. Healthcare is so complex, it's rapidly changing, but the ability to maintain humility and compassion will make your ability to care for your patients very, very profound. So, Today, many of you will become healers. Many of you will help to run systems that will heal. There is no industry or field where people have the opportunity to care for someone at what might be the worst time in their life and trust in you. So take care of your patients because they will want and deserve the benefits of your capabilities and your humility. I thank you very much, class of 2014. Please, go forth. Take care of all of the people that you encounter in your career and maintain humility. Thank you.